Hello, welcome everybody. It's Sarah Haas here with another episode of the Boss Body Podcast. I am so happy to be here and I am so happy to have you here with me. So I have such an interesting guest on with me today. Her name is Dr. Ellen Albertson, and she's known as the midlife whisperer. So she is a, a psychologist and a registered dietitian and also a national board sort of certified health and wellness coach. But what is really interested and what I really want to dig into today is she's also a best-selling author and her book is called rock your midlife. So it's the subtitle is transform yourself and make your next chapter, your best chapter. So Dr. Ellen is definitely an expert on all things midlife, which I know a lot of you listening are, I know I am just turned 50. And one more interesting fact and something that we have in common is that Dr. Ellen is also a breast cancer survivor. So she definitely has a lot of wisdom and a lot of experience to share. So Dr. Ellen, I am so happy to have you here. Thank you for being here. Well, thanks for having me and happy birthday. 50 is a big one. Yes, yes. I turned 50 this year and I celebrated two years cancer free in the same year. So it was a biggie. <laughs> yeah, that is absolutely huge. And I love that you're celebrating it because that's something that I'm so about is this idea of pro aging, right? Not turning back the clock, not wishing we were 26 again, but making the, the age that you're at right now, your best age. Absolutely. I love it. That's my goal as well. So we are, I am picking up what you're putting down. So you have a book called rock your midlife, and I would love to hear about that. And also maybe just a little bit about your background and how you came to be the midlife whisperer. Sure. Well, I actually have been working with midlife women my entire career, even before I was at midlife myself. So I started my career as a registered dietitian 30 years ago. It's hard to believe I've been a dietitian for almost 30 years and everybody coming to me has always been at midlife. So when I was a dietitian, it was people coming to, you know, the typical lose weight, feel better, reverse things like high cholesterol, and then when I became a personal fitness trainer, again, I was getting in midlife myself, but all the women, I started being a trainer when I was in my forties and everybody coming to me again, were midlife women. And I just love working with midlife women. I've always been attracted to this age and stage. And I think it really can be an amazing time of life. It certainly is a period of huge shifts and transformations. There's so much happening to us physiologically, right? There's a ton happening in our external world. We may be dealing with things like empty nest or struggling with, you know, our personal relationships or our job, our health, all kinds of things. So it's a bit of a maelstrom of stuff going on, which makes it really interesting and a powerful time to take all of that kind of chaos, whatever it is you're experiencing, menopause, what all, all those things and use it to take a look and say, okay, what's working? What's not working? And what do I want this juicy second adulthood to look like? I love so I that. The, yeah. I became yeah. a midlife whisperer. It just occurred to me. I was actually at a um, in, uh, at a women's meeting for entrepreneurs, the entrepreneur women's network. And it just popped into my head. I was thinking like, what do I do? Like, what's my brand? I was kind of a grow and glow coach, but I thought midlife whisperer and no one had it. And it really resonated with what I did and certainly resonates with people that I work with. And so I trademarked it and made it my moniker. Yeah. And that's, that's perfect. Cause it totally encompasses what you're doing. And what you said is so true. You know, uh, I'm 50. I just, you know, recovered from having breast cancer. I have one kid in college and one in high school. So in a year or so, I'm going to be an empty nester. Plus I went through a divorce several years ago after 17 years of marriage. So you're, you're so spot on that this time of your life, it's almost a shit storm. <laughs> 
a whole perfect storm of all these things coming together. And at the same time, you're dealing with this changing body. You know, I was in, put into menopause during chemotherapy. So it was just like, boom, and you know, all the hot flashes and all that great stuff just just ascended upon me or descended upon me all at once. So navigating this time of your life is a challenge, but I love the positivity that you've put into it because even though a lot of it is difficult, you also gain so much so much knowledge and so much wisdom and so much self-confidence and you start like not giving a shit what other people think about you and like, oh, well, so what? I made a mistake on this. I'm going to just move on. And yeah, I'm not perfect. You know, I don't have the body I had when I was in my twenties, but look at me, I'm rocking it because I'm working hard and I'm healthy and I'm strong. So I love, I love everything about what you just said. <laughs> yeah. Well, it is that really like you said, a bit of a shit storm, right? But the, the good news is that there's a dip in our happiness that happens in our forties, but the research really shows that there's a huge upswing. So if you can navigate this period and use it like that, you know, chrysalis said, okay, I'm, I'm really needing to change and transform. You can emerge that butterfly and be like, okay, I'm going to fly now. And I know myself as I'm kind of coming out of the end of yes, divorced too. And I went blind three times and I was just diagnosed with breast cancer and I'm in remission, but I'm also engaged to an incredible new man. And I love where I live and I have great friends and I love my career and I love my life. So I'm in that upswing period of time. And that's really, I wrote the book, rock your midlife, because I wanted to give people specific steps that they could take things that I learned, what I learned from my clients, because, you know, as a coach, we only can work through with a handful of people. So I wanted to give people a real juice see how to book that they could pick up and any of the seven steps would really help them transform. And I also want to change the way we look at midlife. If you Google midlife, Sarah, do you know what comes up? <laughs> I don't know. All bad stuff like over crisis. the hill. Yeah, and, exactly. Right. Wrong your side midlife, of 40, your crisis. midlife crisis. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And like Bidet Brown says, you know, a crisis is a short lived thing like breast cancer. That is a crisis. We're like, okay, I'm going through this thing. But midlife, as she puts it, is really a much more of a of a longer term thing where you're grappling with some deep issues. You know, it's a time of real transformational change. And I love that we're having this conversation because I think the more we talk about it, the more women can be like, okay, I can feel okay. Like you said, when I make mistakes, when my life's not going perfect, we get this idea that everything's supposed to be perfect. And that can make us feel, especially if we're like doing the social comparison thing and looking at people on Instagram and seeing how great their lives are. Let me tell you, those people on Instagram underneath it, I know so many people on Instagram who like do it as their therapy to make it look like their life has got it all together. And underneath it, they've got all kinds of issues. Yeah. I read a quote once that said, don't compare everyone else's highlight reel to your behind the scenes. <laughs> and that's the perfect example. It's like, here's my Instagram life. It looks perfect. Of course, you're not putting all the pain and the struggle out there. You're putting the days when you feel good and you feel beautiful and you're taking trips and everything's going great. <laughs> you know, when you put the pain and the struggle in, like I actually did a bunch of reels. I literally did a reel when I was on the gurney waiting to go in the ER to have my lumpectomy to me. I got so many people resonating seeing well, if she can be positive and it's, you know, that way it really inspires me to do my best. So I kind of try to show my little hot mess moments mm -hmm. too. Yeah, I do too. I really try to be uh, as much of an open book as possible because I think when you're authentic, you give people permission to also be authentic and vulnerable and open. And I think, you know, so many people are realizing that Instagram is all Photoshop and it's all fake and it's not doing anybody any good. It's just doing harm. So tell me about your book. So you said that there's seven steps in your book on how to rock your midlife. Can you break some of those down for us? Sure. Well, you just hit number one, which is authenticity. So if you're going to rock your midlife, you've got to be yourself. What happens is if you're not yourself, you're climbing up this ladder of success, you're building your life, but it's against the wrong building. I think a lot of us do that. We think that, you know, 
if you know my marriage looks it was my situation everything looked great on the outside like this perfect apple but it was rotten inside and i was miserable because i was living somebody else's life what society told me i should want or what parents peers or instagram says is going to make you happy you've got to know yourself and i have tons of journaling prompts where you think about like what did i love to do as a kid all kinds of places where you can go to do strength tests and work on your core values to figure out who am I? What do I stand for? Because that's kind of your North Star. So that's number one. Number two is love yourself. And I'm sure you get the same question from women all the time, because I know you're a lot about self-love is like, how the hell do you do that? And for me, that's all about learning something called self-compassion, which is actually an emotional regulatory technique where you treat yourself the way you would a good friend. So instead of saying, you know, I shouldn't feel depressed or I shouldn't be sad or I shouldn't be scared. You really um, learn how to process all your emotions and accept them just the way that you are. And when things go wrong, instead of saying, oh my God, this shouldn't be happening to me, you treat yourself like a good friend. You give yourself what you need. And what's the cool thing is, is when you practice self-compassion, it's really the how of self-love. When you treat yourself like a good friend, you start to love yourself. And what happens is you start attracting things that are in your best interest and you stop doing those things that insult your soul. The third step- that- I, I want to jump in real hey, go quick. Ahead. I love that you give a tangible action step because I think we do hear that a lot. Like you have to love yourself. You have to love yourself almost to the point it's gotten sort of cliche and people are like, okay, like, do I love myself? Do I not love myself? Like, how do I know? How do I figure this out? And what you said is start thinking about treating yourself as you would a good friend because that is how you show yourself love because we're so great at giving it out to everybody right. else. You know, so many of us, especially women, we're nurturers. We, we take care of everyone. We love everyone. You know, we're kind and generous, but not to ourselves. So I just wanted to stress that because I think that's a really, really good point. Yeah. And in terms of, you know, what you share about the body, this was a learning self-compassion was a huge revelation for me because my research showed that it actually improved body image. So when people practice self-compassion, body shame went down, body dissatisfaction went down and body appreciation went up. And so what I do with my clients now is we start with self-love. We don't get to this place like when I have the perfect body, right? Those six pack abs or whatever BS, you know, those kind of diet magic bullet solutions are selling you, then I'll love myself. But no, you start with loving yourself and you eat right, you move your body, you take care of yourself, you get the sleep, all of the things because you're doing it because you love yourself. So that is key. And then we get into, you know, the next step is really uh, how to raise your vibration, how to increase your energy, both physiologically, what to eat, because women at midlife, we need more protein. We need to make sure we're getting enough vitamin D, enough calcium. We're typically having trouble with sleep because of things like, you know, hormonal fluctuations that cause hot flashes and night sweats. And then we're also have anxiety and depression, which can keep us up at night. So how do you take care of your body and how do you manage your energy levels? Number four is reprogramming your brain. So this is all about the mindset and the positivity without toxic positivity. It's not that when things go bad, you're like, oh, this shouldn't be happening. Or I don't really feel sad. You know, you've, you've been through breast cancer like me. So we're like, yeah, this is happening. I'm upset. So I'm going to process these difficult emotions through the act of self-compassion, but then also staying positive, seeing, you know, what do I have control over? What can I do? How do I stay um, optimistic and really keep the faith that everything's going to be okay? So fours is, is all about that sort of neuroplasticity, reprogramming your brain. Five is about empowerment which was a, um, a step that I didn't totally understand until my breast cancer diagnosis. I wrote the book first, then I got diagnosed. I'm sure you're the same way of just, you've got to be empowered to make decisions. I think a lot of women, whether it's breast cancer or something else, we give our power away. We're like, I don't want to deal with those finances, or I don't want to deal with the fact that my marriage isn't working, or I don't even want to deal with the fact that like my weight is out of control and my body's not where it should be. I'm just going to ignore it and be disempowered or let someone else tell me what to do. Empowerment is really figuring out power from within. How do I feel empowered? How do I advocate for myself? You know, how do I talk to my doctor or how do I make those health, wellness, relationship, career decisions on my own getting empowered? And I think it's really hard for a lot of women because we're 
we want to, you know, we're people pleasers. We want people to like us. We're told mm-hmm. to like be good. And sometimes being empowered means you got to be a bit of a badass. You got to bring that fierce self compassion, which is like that mama bear advocating for yourself into the picture. So that's five is empowerment. And, then yeah, we and I think in, in the first half of life, we very much are more in that people pleasing stage and, you know, wanting people to like us, wanting that external validation, you know, wanting to feel worthy and loved and afraid that if we don't do X, Y, and Z, people are going to leave us. People aren't going to like us. And then in the second half, you start taking those actions to to give yourself that empowerment and to really like lean into, okay, I'm in charge here. And, you know, authenticity was your first one. I'm going to be authentic. I'm going to do what I need to do. I don't care how the general public is going to respond because the people that resonate with me and that love me are going to be drawn to me and are going to stay with me regardless. Right. Which gets us to six, which is rehab your relationships. And so what happens so often, and I don't know if this has been your experience, Sarah, but when you start to be the butterfly, a lot of people are like, no, no, you're a caterpillar. You're still, they see you and they think you're still the caterpillar and you've done all this transformation you're feeling good. You're confident. You feel beautiful. You feel strong. You feel healthy. You feel positive, but they still see you in the way that they used to relate to you. And so this chapter is really all about rehabbing those relationships about, you know, letting that good girl go creating boundaries. This is something I did with a client today. I was like, you got to create some boundaries with your husband. You know, this is, you have to put some parameters around certain interactions that you have on a daily basis that are actually very draining for you. So you create a personal bill of rights around boundaries. And then I also teach something called nonviolent communications, which is a way of getting your needs met. And what I found is that those relationships that are really um, important, people who love you and who you love back, well, that stuff's, that's going to evolve and grow. And those relationships that aren't working, those are going to fall away. Like when I got divorced, I lost a lot of relationships, but you know what? Now I have really amazing friends who are resonating with who I am today. Not that kind of fake me that seemed to feel like on the outside, everything was okay. But inside I was crumbling, but now that I'm just being myself, I'm being authentic. I'm loving myself. I'm attracting amazing friends. I just never thought I would have such an incredible community. I think that's something so cool at midlife is that your definition of a family changes, right? We still have, I still am so blessed to have my parents are alive and I have siblings and I've got two kids. So I've got this, you know, family, but then I've also created this whole family. I live in this beautiful Island and I've got this amazing community of people. And then I've got another community in uh, the town of Burlington, which is like 40 minutes from where I live. And so I've created and this sort of international community of people like yourself, right? Who I meet through social media. So at midlife, I think you can create a whole new level of relationships. I like how your steps build on each other because it's almost like you have to do these first few, like the self-love and the reprogramming to step into empowerment and really empowerment is what's going to allow you to rehab those relationships and to be able to stand up for yourself and set those boundaries and feel good about it and know that your people love you and the ones who really don't, they're going to move on and that's okay. Yeah. And it starts with knowing yourself, like knowing who I am and what I resonate with and having the courage to, to be yourself. But the, the cool thing is you can start at any of the steps, but I personally started at the self-compassion step. Uh, I I learned self-compassion because it was my dissertation topic. So the universe was like, you need to learn this before I was the worst, I had the worst self-critic. Like I was, I was that person on the gym floor pumping up those you know, two 20 pound dumbbells doing uh, crunch, doing, you know, lifts and squats at the same time, working out four to six hours a day with all my clients, negative body image. I was like a alcoholic in a liquor store. I can Um, relate a hundred percent, just that type a perfectionist. And no matter how hard you try, no matter how much you achieve, you just always feel like it isn't enough and you're not enough and you have to try harder. And you never get there. 
you know, no matter there. how much you body image is in your mind, not in your body. So no matter how much weight you lose, no matter how, you know, how cut up you are, any of those things. And now I, again, I start with, let's love ourselves first mm -hmm. and eat right, take care of our bodies, you know, do that self-care, do that, making sure we're getting enough sleep and rest from the self-love. So I feel like self-love is of the steps that's really what started for me. And then the last step is enlightenment. And that's really about finding meaning, finding purpose. And I think that's something that happens at midlife where we become wiser, as you were saying, those challenges in life have a way of chiseling us so that we, you know, it's like that, there's that quote about Michelangelo when they ask him like, how did you know the Pieta was there or the David? And he's like, well, I could see it in the marble and then you got to chip away mm -hmm. and all the stuff. And so finding where the purpose, the meaning is, what's your spiritual connection. Maybe you go back to a spirituality from your childhood, a religion of your childhood, or you find something new. A lot of people are practicing, you know, yoga and meditation. So it's about finding a spiritual practice, finding meaning and purpose and realizing that you're a spiritual being having a human experience, not I'm a human and spirituality is something I do on the occasional Sunday, but like spirituality is maybe something I do every day. I pause for a few minutes throughout my day. I do some gratitude work. I spend time in nature. I am kind to others. I practice compassion. You know, I do some charitable work and, and really figuring out what that is for you. Mm -hmm. So really all of these steps almost to me are like peeling back those layers of the onion, you know, and opening yourself up and being vulnerable and then moving into authenticity and enlightenment and all those wonderful things. So it's really encouraging, um, everything that you're talking about. Cause I think it gives a lot of people some hope if they're in, in the shit storm and it's tough and you really, it, it's hard sometimes to see the light at the end, but there is one and it feels really, really good when you get to the other side and that all these are a work in progress. You know, it's a life journey. It's your work and none of it's ever going to be perfect. But as you move through these steps, you just get better and better and better and you rock your life. Yeah. I think you, you get in flow, right? You just find like, I wake up every morning joyful and energized and excited to start my day. And I'm happy that I'm making a difference in the world and I'm enjoying my life more. I think the breast cancer diagnosis really helped me deal with my workaholism that sort of, we talked a little bit about the perfectionist. It's always, we're always works in progress, learning what we need to learn to move forward. And I think in the book too, I also give an entire chapter getting unstuck because at midlife, we feel really unstuck. We have so many structures that we have put in place in our life. So the thought of like getting a divorce or even starting a new wellness practice or switching careers or jobs can feel really daunting. And there's this neuroscience piece where your brain is interested in keeping you safe. It's not interested in you being happy and fulfilled and rocking midlife. So things like getting a divorce or mm -hmm. changing careers, or even, you know, go, I'm sure you have this all the time, going to the gym or deciding I'm going to switch my diet, but then what am I going to do? on Thursday nights, when I go out, you know, for nacho platter and drinks with the girls, like, what are they going to say when I say, I really want the grilled chicken or, you know, or the, the cocktail shrimp, and I'm going to have a wine spritzer instead, am I going to lose friends or what's going to happen with my marital relationship? Or how am I going to feel when I go to the gym and I, and I don't feel comfortable because there's people who are maybe I perceive as in better shape than me. So there's a lot of fear there yeah. and we have to sort of call it out, shine a light on it, feel it, put in the back seat and get excited because the rest of your life is ahead of you, whatever age you are. So why not rock it? Yeah. And it's, it, it is safe to stay in your comfort zone, but you're not going to get what you want if you're just staying stuck. And so I feel like your book is really going to be helpful for a lot of people to push past that fear of the unknown or of failure or, you know, whatever it is that's keeping them in that comfort zone and encourage them to take a step outside the comfort zone. And I always like when I work with my personal training clients, I tell them, 
okay, we're not going to start off the first day with some crazy, insane workout that you you're dying. And then you can't walk the next day. We're going to take you, I'm going to push you outside your comfort zone a little bit, and then we're going to build on that. And so I like that you have these seven steps because people can work through those, you know, at a pace and, and you can't do it all at once. It, it has to be a, a slow unraveling process. So if people want to read your book, I know I do, I'm getting it like immediately as soon as we finish with this call, where can they find it? The big Amazon, just put rock your midlife in there, or you can put probably Ellen Alberts in, it'll come right up. It's also available through Amazon on my website, which is the midlifewhisperer.com. That's the midlifewhisperer.com. Awesome. Thank you for buying it. Yes. And thank you for being here today. Oh my, I could talk to you for hours. I mean, I could see, I'm going to have to have you back on and maybe break down and get into detail a little bit more on each one of these steps. Cause seriously, every single one of them is so juicy and power packed. <laughs> like We could do seven different podcasts on just on each one of each of these subjects. So thanks so much for being here. Thank you. All right, everybody, that is our show for today. I hope to see you again soon, and I will see you next time. 